Well, today we are in Jer uh, Lamentations chapter 4. Uh, we're done with the book of Jeremiah, but Lamentations chapter 4. It's all about the siege of, siege of Jerusalem. It talks about the, uh, describes the siege. Jeremiah gives us kind of an inside account. Then he tells us about the cause of the siege. And then finally, it'll, give a, it'll end on a note of hope, as often chapters in Lamentations does. So in verses 1 through 10, again, hope you have your Bible in front of you. Uh, verses 1 through 10 are about the siege of Jerusalem. It's really a vivid and detailed eyewitness account of what happened during its siege. Uh, it's kind of the insider view. Jeremiah was there. He witnessed the onslaught coming from the uh, Babylonian troops that were... Um, Entering the city, you can imagine the uh, devastation that followed them. Verses 1 to 2 really talk about the uh, most precious things of the city are laid waste. What are those? Well, of course, the riches of the city, but more important, the sons, the sons of Zion, the people, the uh, children, uh, as we'll see here. Um, just the total devastation uh, that happens to the nation here. And hard to, rem hard to imagine some of this uh, brutality that's happening, but uh, Jeremiah is a witness to these things. Verses 3 through 6, uh, we see the, um, just the extreme uh, horror of what's happening here. The mothers have grown callous toward their starving children. And these once privileged people, this nation of Israel that God had promised to bless in all kinds of material ways if they had adhered to the covenant in Deuteronomy, they had abandoned that. And as a result, they were reduced really to like an ash heap almost, uh, seeking help from other, other people. Verses 7 to 8, this once regal, you could say well-groomed, well taken care of people are really hardly recognizable even as people at all as they've been uh, devastated during this siege. Verses 9 through 10 of this chapter really talk about a quick death would have been preferable to what the survivors have to endure after the siege of Jerusalem. Chapter 2 uh, God made it clear that all these chase that the horrors of this chastening of his own people were his doing. And the magnitude of the horror here, I think, reflects God's horror at sin. This is a reminder, even now in the church age, how devastating sin is in the church. What a horror that is to God. In Ephesians 4.30, it says that we grieve the Holy Spirit when we sin. I think when we sin individually and when we sin as a body, when we sin as a church. So this is um, kind of an object lesson uh, for how God feels about sin and the, the magnitude of his uh, devastation, his own personal grief over sin is commensurate with his what's called talionic judgment, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, the judgment that fits the crime we see here that God is always just bringing horrible devastation on his people because it's a reflection of how he feels about sin. I think it's also a reminder of us, to us to take sin seriously. Sometimes we don't take it as seriously as we ought to take it, uh, certainly not as serious as God does. So when we see this kind of devastation brought on his own people, it, uh, it's kind of a horror to us. Uh, it's hard for us to understand how God could do this unless we look at it from the perspective of God's anger about sin. Verses 11 through 20 of this chapter then go on to talk about the cause of this devastation. And verse 11 lays the clause out clearly, or the cause out clearly. It's clear, you know, chapter 2 uh, told us this, and now it's brought. Uh, up again, that this is God's wrath against his people. Verses 12 through 13, God did what he thought, what was 
thought to be impossible by bringing the Babylonians into Jerusalem. This is clearly God's hand that's at work here. They thought the city was impregnable. They thought it was going to stand. Uh, that was certainly the case in Hezekiah that God intervened with um, to protect the city. But now, in this case, he did not. He withdrew his hand of protection. The false and unfaithful prophets and priests have led the nation into this. God's withdrawn his hand, and they're suffering the result. Notice also here, brothers and sisters, that the, there is no excuse for being led astray. The people should have known better. The people should have, they had everything available that they could compare with these false prophets and what these false priests were saying to the word that they had in Deuteronomy. And they're held accountable for that. They can't blame it on other people who have taken them, taken them captive or misled them. So in verses 14 through 20, then, we see the result that God has scattered his unclean people because of their uncleanness. And again, by way of application here, I think we could say that God must punish sin, especially the sin that's un among his own people. First Peter says, if judgment begins with the house of God, what will the outcome of it be? And certainly here we see punishment beginning uh, in Israel, uh, punishment falls on the church as well. It's kind of a warning that at some point he'll act decisively in seemingly possibly even impossible ways to bring his people to recognize their sin and to bring them to repentance. Chapter ends on an upbeat note, uh, kind of a warning to Edom as well as an encouragement to Israel. The warning to Egypt or Edom is that they should make the most of the victory that they're enjoying. Now, Edom was a ally of Nebuchadnezzar. They assisted Nebuchadnezzar in the devastation of Jerusalem, and they should celebrate while they can. That's what it's saying here in these verses, because the tables are going to be turned. And this, again, is a good um, um Reminder for us, an encouragement for us in the church age to learn from Israel and know that judgment doesn't mean abandonment. Now, this is a true at the personal level as well as the corporate level. When God brings judgment on you as an individual or on me as an individual, it's because of his love for us. He's chastening us as a father would chasten his son in order to help them grow, help them mature, help them get better. So it's really, if you're not under some level of chastening in your life, you need to wonder, is God with me? On the other hand, when that chastening comes, it's best to learn the lesson and move on from it. Because again, judgment doesn't mean abandonment, far from it. The church experiences judgment in all its forms because God regards the church, that is you individually, and the church corporately with the love of the Father for the Son. So if you find yourself even now under the chastening hand of God, take heart. He loves you. He cares about you. Learn the lesson and move on. So God bless you, brothers and sisters, as we make our way through the book of Lamentations and look forward to the book of Ezekiel, a really important book um, and a book that has a lot to say about end times and the uh, what's going to happen during those last days of history that we read about in the book of Revelation. So God bless you and enjoy your reading today.